Fire to men. This is from Sop's War. Stan couldn't quite get it clear in his mind on the voyage overseas. Possibly it was because none of the truly desperate were on the pilgrimage. Only the socially acceptables. Only those who passed for well, well, well enough. He remembered Jenny telling him how, in the casualty clearing station, during a general action, it got so she could feel which men were slipping under, which still cleared the hurdles of death. She read it in more than their faces. It was as if something moved in on them, clouded over blankets and semi-shrouded forms, lying in rows on the ground, like the keys of some great organ, groaning stops of war. In Toronto, it was far more clear, an ex-soldier, say, at work, from one of the usual resented, resentful cliques of returned men that dotted every company, would start coming in late, disheveled, absent-minded. His mates, of course, would cover for him at first, until it became plain to them, too, the thing that stalked them all had seized their former comrade. Everyone carried invisible wounds, but some began to show before their bodies went into the ground. Shaking at work, unable to eat, hold their sandwiches in the lunchroom, an odor about their person, fear, the smell of a hunted animal whose hiding place has been found out. At some point, even the veterans had to turn their backs in order to keep their jobs, their self-respect, in order to keep themselves from going under also. The fired man would show up in the park, across from work, on a work day. Stan might even sit with him, share confidences none too confident. The other would be drinking, of course, drinking or shaking or both, and always hard up. Small change for what great change was happening. Another survivor clawed back, the war reaching out its scrabby hand then most when the coast was clear. If time was stopped for these men, space was frozen solid. There was nowhere to step without pain. One too many patrols into no man's land. One too many sharded objects embedded in flesh. And then there was the fact that bullets cannot be faced. They have none. They tear into them, bullets, into faces, but don't introduce themselves. To ask a man repeatedly to face the unfaceable was, sooner or later, to unmake him completely. Worst things last. We all go under eventually, and just before we cross that line, everyone, and I mean every man jack of us, turns away. The line we cross is in the turning away of others, those we called mate, sister, brother, love, fine and dandy. But what, if, but what Stan wanted to know was, you didn't turn on the dimes they begged you for. What was the incipient cause and how could you catch it? Maybe even make it yours. Was that too much to ask? And of whom? They had faced death, faceless or not, so often. It was all out of countenance with them. The graveyards of Canada were already gorging themselves on government slabs, hillsides of old mates ranged apart from their families by choice. It scared him more than rising from the fire step. There, at least, in the white heat of fate, you were, momentarily, agent. But this, this obscene slippage, no metal, ribbon, or battalion battle patch could cover it. It meant urinating in doorways and being beaten by police, and even the small Britannic shield on their much-coveted service badges wasn't proof against it. So Stan wore his indifferently and lost it frequently. No matter. He passed. Besides, it always came back to him with its motto, for service at the front, running under in sober sans serif. The four dots for the four core divisions, he fancied. No one told him that. He was obsessed with meaning. And the initialism, C-E-F, seraphed and pointed by the knowledge that no one could wear one of these and not have seen that. And yet to the truly broken, even these became badges of shame, and the others hated them for it. Hated and forgave and forgot then, too, how open they had been, how happy to see men other than themselves in the ranks, Indians, Ukrainians, Italians, Japanese, Negroes, not to mention battalions of Chinese laboring in the, in the rear, Jews, Germans, yes, and sharp as tacks, those we now call indigenous. All these became progressively non grata as the years closed in on those who had served, mainstream, sidelined men. 
who had fought under the maple leaf. His mind was wandering, his stomach was heaving. The thought of lying with Jenny in a shared cabin of the steamship Montrose nearly made him sick.